What's up and welcome to another episode of Gizmo Slip Tech. Today we're taking a look at the HP Pavilion 16.1 inch model. This is, that's like literally the name. I don't know why HP went with that. We're just gonna call it the HP Pavilion 16 for short C's. Now HP has designed this laptop for the budget conscious gamer that's looking for a moderate to large laptop that's thin, light, portable. They designed it to pack enough gaming potency to be able to play all modern games while at the same time not destroying your wallet. Now when someone says a budget gaming laptop, I think arguably the most important question is, okay, what are the trade-offs? Like, yeah, it'll save me $500 compared to getting like an Acer Predator Helios 300, but can this still actually play games really well? Or do you just sacrifice too much performance and it's just not worth it, it's better just to save your money and buy a more powerful laptop? That is the question that that we will be trying to answer today in this review. Is it worth buying at $729, which is what it's currently listed on Newegg's website? Now I gotta give a shout out to Newegg for sending this laptop over and sponsoring this episode. Sponsorships from Newegg help make this channel possible and cover costs of production. That said, I can say whatever I want about the laptop and just be honest with you guys, a Newegg sponsorship essentially means they send me the product and then I use their Newegg links in the video description down below and that's it. They have no control over my content here whatsoever. These reviews are my honest opinion. Now without further ado, let's get on with this review. Taking a look at the specs, we've got an i5-10300H which is a 4 core 8 thread CPU, an Nvidia GTX 1650Ti graphics card, 12 gigs of RAM in dual channel, 256 gig SSD with an open and available two and a half inch HDD SSD slot and a 60 hertz IPS display. Arguably, just from looking at these specs, I can tell you that it's a bummer we don't have a high refresh rate display on this unit. There are a number of competitive shooters that definitely could take advantage of the high refresh rate display. All right, well, let's go ahead and hop into some benchmarks right away and see how this laptop performs. So first up, taking a look at the power limits on the i5 CPU, we got 45 watts of power, and on the GTX 1650 Ti, we get up to 50 watts of power. So right off the bat, we know that we have fairly low-end components that are not gonna take too much juice, and that's one of the reasons why we have such a small and light power brick. So taking a look at the benchmarks, Red Dead Redemption 2 on Ultra getting 40 frames per second. So you can play Red Dead Redemption 2 on Ultra. Now Cyberpunk 2077, the game you guys probably really want to know, can this laptop run it? Well, the good news is when you have it on low, it can actually hit 40 frames per second, but anything above medium drops the frame rate on average down below 30, making it a bit of a challenge to run comfortably. Now, if you were to drop the resolution down to say 720p, you might be able to run it on ultra settings above 30 FPS. That said, at 1080p on low, the game still looks really really good. There's very few graphical bugs and glitches. The only thing I noticed was like a texture of a car that took a second to load in, but that was happening even on my RTX 2080 Ti desktop. That's just the nature of the game being buggy and not because of the laptop's lack of video RAM. With Valorant on Ultra, we got 153 frames per second, which I think is very impressive for a budget machine, meaning that if you were to get a 1080p 144 hertz external monitor, hook it up to the HDMI, you can have excellent competitive shooter gameplay with games like CSGO, Overwatch, Valorant, but of course your mileage will vary as you get into more demanding games like Battlefield 5 and Apex Legends where you're gonna struggle to hit 60 frames per second consistently depending on the region area, how much is going on on the screen and stuff like that. Now with Far Cry 5, we did manage to average 59 frames per second on Ultra at 1080p. That's a very modern game, getting very high frames per second. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, 48. So again, very playable. Basically, every single game on this list is playable at ultra settings, except for Cyberpunk 2077, where you have to turn it down to low. Taking a look at some synthetic benchmarks to give us an idea of the performance per dollar and all of that. 3D Mark Time Spy graphics, we've got 3625. Of course, it's the bottom of the pack because this is the weakest laptop that I've ever reviewed in theory, at least on specs sheet, along with the Acer Nitro 5. On 3D Mark Time Spy points per pound, we got 746. This is a fairly light machine coming in at 4.86 pounds. Now, when it comes to points per dollar, 
dollar, this thing absolutely crushes it at 4.97 points per dollar. This is the top performing machine per dollar that I've ever tested. Now when it comes to Cinebench R20, again, we're at the bottom of the pack because we only have a quad core CPU here with eight threads. It just can't compete against six and eight core CPUs. Again, on our points per pound, not doing so great, but it's all right because our points per dollar is pretty good. And again, on the points per dollar, we're near the top of the pack at 2.78. And that's simply because we're spending so much less on this laptop compared to other laptops and still getting some solid performance out of it. Like a few years ago, uh, a quad core processor was the standard. And this is like equal to like the best quad core processors from a few years ago. Keep in mind that this processor, well, it may not be as strong for rendering when it comes to gameplay, this i5 processor will do really, really well because it can clock up to 4.5 gigahertz with a max turbo boost. Though, typically speaking, I saw around 4.2 to 4.3 gigahertz most of the time. Now for rendering in Handbrake with a 4K video file, we got 17 minutes and 25 seconds. Not that great, just a little bit faster than the Acer Nitro 5. So what this means is, yes, you can use this for video editing with like Adobe Premiere Pro, but when you render the file out, expect the render to take a lot more time than a multi-threaded higher core count CPU laptop. Now with every laptop I review, I do a dual load stress test where I run a Heaven graphics benchmark while at the same time running the Firestrike physics CPU test. Now this test reveals the potential of the laptop, showing how noisy it can can get as well as what temperatures you can expect in a worst case scenario. Now with most more expensive gaming laptops, you have different fan and power profiles. With the HP Pavilion 16, you're looking at one default power profile and that's it as far as I can tell. I downloaded the software off of HP's website and it did not do anything. The Omen software here lets you look at the vitals of your system but doesn't actually let you adjust anything in there. Now if you download third party fan and and power limit changing applications like Intel XTU and Throttle Stop, you might be able to tweak the performance a little bit and also increase the fan speeds so you get lower temperatures. But since the laptop did not come with those tools, I did not go out of my way to do that testing because it's not representative of how most people are going to use the laptop. But I just want you to know that those tools are there if you want to tweak the laptop's performance in the future. Taking a look at the results of my stress test, 49 decibels of fan noise is quite quite good. Most laptops end up in the 52 to 54 decibels when under default fans from my experience. So this is a quite a bit quieter laptop in general. Now when it comes to fan noise in idle mode, sometimes the fans do kick on and you can hear them a little bit. But generally speaking, the laptop tends to stay very quiet. Now during the dual load stress test, we got 71 degrees on the GPU and 92 degrees on the CPU. The GPU at 71 is fantastic, but the CPU at 92 degrees is a bit hotter than I would prefer, though it's not that big of a deal. These chips are designed to run at up to 100 degrees Celsius. That said, you can power limit the chip using something like Intel XDU to reduce the temperatures. Now the clock speed I got on the GPU was 1710 and we averaged 4.16 gigahertz on the CPU during the stress test, which again is really, really good. Now for the Far Cry 5 gaming benchmark, we got 59 frames per second. Now keep in mind that when you are playing Far Cry 5, you've got a lot of really large texture files and you've only got four gigs of video memory on this laptop. So you might want to turn down the textures from being the ultra setting down to the medium setting or just high setting so that you don't run into texture issues causing additional stuttering like I experienced in Far Cry 5. With just a couple of tweaks in Far Cry 5, I managed to bump the average frame rate up from about 59 to a little bit closer to 72, 73, which basically guarantees you're gonna maintain that 60 frames per second average far more often. Now, because this laptop does not have G-Sync, you may want to run V-Sync, which helps reduce screen tearing and ghosting, which is an issue on this laptop. And that's partially because this also does not have that that high of a response rate display. So if you're someone who's like an ultra competitive gamer, you wanna play games like CSGO, Valorant, Overwatch at really high frame rates and really high response times, the internal display on this laptop is not 
that great for that particular type of gaming. The display in this laptop is good for games like Far Cry 5, Cyberpunk 2077, games where you're not trying to have ultra fast reflexes constantly trying to beat out other players. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we got 48 frames per second. Again, that's very playable, especially since it's a single player game. For speaker loudness, the speakers get up to 73 decibels in our test. And that's about average for a gaming laptop. And I just found that to be pretty impressive overall because of how budget oriented this machine is. It's competing with laptops that are two to three times more expensive. So what this means is because the fans are not super loud and because the speakers are moderately loud, you can actually have a pretty good gaming experience just with the onboard speakers without headphones, which is really nice because not all laptops can do that. Now the ports on this machine are quite nice for a budget laptop. On the left side we have a USB type A and the power adapter port. I like the placement of the power adapter port on the left side because it allows most users who use the mouse on the right side to have that side of the laptop be completely clear. Now on the back and front we have no ports and on the right side we have a full size SD card reader, a headphone and mic port, a USB-C with display port, an ethernet port, another USB type A and and an HDMI out port. Overall, the port selection is really solid for a budget gaming laptop. That said, we are missing out on a Thunderbolt 3 port and potentially maybe a third USB type a. Now when it comes to this display, it is a very bright and contrasty display for the budget. That said, it's only a 60 hertz display and the response rate to boot is not that great. So if you're, again, if you're a competitive gamer, this display is not geared towards you. It's geared towards a casual gamer on a budget. Now keep in mind that the sRGB value, which ideally the standard right now for mid tier and up gaming laptops is 100% sRGB, but this only has 64% sRGB. That said, the high brightness and contrastiness of the display does hide the fact that it has a lower color gamut pretty well, making the gaming experience still very good in my opinion. Now it features a minimal bezel on the sides and top with a larger bezel on the bottom. It does still have a webcam with dual microphones. Some gaming laptops this year were skipping the webcam, so it's nice to see that. Now the chassis on this laptop is kind of hit and miss depending on what part of the chassis you're pressing on. There is basically no flex in the wrist rests, but when you get to the deck of the keyboard, there is some noticeable flex. Now the chassis of this machine is entirely made of plastic, making it a very lightweight laptop for its size at less than five pounds and being a larger display, that's pretty impressive. The plastic chassis results in a less rigid body compared to all metal builds in more expensive laptops. But for the price, I really like this chassis and it feels very solid and the flex in the keyboard did not impact me using the keyboard in any way as far as I could tell. It has good depth and the backlight is really impressive. I just wish you could change the setting so that the backlight would stay on and not turn off randomly after 30 seconds. Now I really like the keyboard loud. It's very functional. The keys are spaced really well. The font is good. The backlighting is very clear. All the symbols are backlit, which is fantastic. Not all laptops have that. And then we do have a dedicated numpad with dedicated home and page up, page down keys on the right side. I just don't love the arrow keys here. We've got the skinny middle up and down arrows with big fat right and left arrows. I much prefer it when they are all full size arrow keys makes it much easier to use. But while I wrote the review for this laptop, the keyboard experience was simply fantastic. And if you're someone that needs to do a lot of typing, this keyboard will work really well for you. Now the touchpad is very functional, but it is a plastic touchpad. So it's not as premium feeling as a more expensive touchpad. That said, the functionality is still there. And in my opinion, that's really what matters. Now I do want to note that when you lightly press on the touchpad, sometimes you get this kind of click that happens when you're not even clicking anything. It's not that big of a deal. It doesn't actually affect it, but it just makes the laptop touchpad feel a little bit less premium because there's like a pre-click 
before the click. This issue may be just this laptop in particular, but it's a common issue for budget-oriented touchpads. That said, I do love the fact that we do have under the touchpad buttons on this machine. Overall, I really like the touchpad and keyboard. They're very functional, although they don't quite have that premium flair. Now, one con for this laptop is it does come with a lot of pre-installed software. You've got an antivirus, you've got Dropbox, you've got the HP warranty software. All three of these things popped up in the course of me using this software and interrupted my time with it. So HP, stop it with all of these pop-ups and stop installing this bloatware. It's just annoying your users. Upgrading this laptop is not too hard. You need to take out eight total Phillips head screws off the bottom, and then you also need to pry it apart very carefully all the way around the sides. It is stuck together really tightly. Now, four of the Phillips head screws are pretty small, so you're gonna wanna make sure that you have a multi-size Phillips head small head screwdrivers to take off the bottom. Now once the bottom is taken off you'll have easy access to the memory, the SSD slot, as well as the two and a half inch drive slot or if you want to upgrade the Wi-Fi as well that is easily accessible too. Now there are two heat pipes on this machine, two big thick heat pipes as well as two fans pushing the air out the back and middle of the laptop. Now, while using the laptop, I will say that the left side where the WASD keys are does not heat up at all. It stays very, very cool the entire time you're playing or using a laptop. That said, the middle of the laptop and the right wrist rest here, this area can warm up a little bit, perhaps making it uncomfortable if you're in a hot or warm environment. That said, it didn't become too hot to touch or uncomfortable to use, it just becomes warm which like i said if you're gaming you literally won't even be touching that point but if say you're writing a word document while rendering a video you're going to notice that warmth on your right hand and then it comes to battery life with this machine it is really insane when you're idling with like medium brightness airplane mode on you can expect like 10 to 12 hours of use so if you're taking notes in college for example you can get some insane battery life now if you're browsing the web you're looking at between like six to eight hours of use on average now when you're streaming video such as watching netflix i would expect five to seven hours depending on your settings and when it comes to gaming you're going to get about an hour and a half or so of battery life. So in conclusion, the HP Pavilion 16A, at the full retail price of $899, I don't think I can recommend this laptop just because there are RTX 2060 laptops when you get closer to that price point that I'd recommend over this one. But at $729, that's when this laptop becomes a lot more attractive. Not only do you have really good battery life in this laptop, but you can play 1080p games, basically all the games that are out there, including Cyberpunk 2077, and you can play them well enough to enjoy them, at least if you're not super picky about any kind of stuttering or frame rate drops occasionally here and there. So if you're a casual gamer, this is a great option. If you're a competitive gamer, I would really advise you to save another $300 or so get to that thousand dollar eleven hundred dollar price point so that's it for my review of the hp pavilion 16.1 it's an impressive budget laptop that's worth the money if you can get it when it's on sale now if you found this review helpful be sure to hit that like button and if you want to see more of my tech reviews be sure to smack that subscribe button and tap the notification bell to all that's it for this review i'll see you in the next one brandon out